speaker today is uh, Steve Clark, who uh, formerly of this parish, now the, the other place, um, who's going to give a, a talk introducing compositional and distributional the meaning for natural language. Okay. All right, so this is a talk about natural language processing, also known as computational linguistics. So I thought for some members of the audience, I'll have to start out by saying what this is. And so my definition of NLP is the, the branch of artificial intelligence concerned with the automatic analysis, generation and understanding of natural language text. So I quite like analysis because that's the aspect that I'll be talking about today. Um, and something quite interesting has happened in language processing in the last 20 years or so. I don't think paradigm shift is too grand a term for it. I mean, there really has been a complete change in the way that we do research in this field. Um, uh, very briefly, what's happened is that there's been a move away from what I'm calling knowledge-heavy approaches, whereby the knowledge that you need to do intelligent analysis of text was typically provided by linguists in terms of handwritten rules. There's been a move to trying to learn that knowledge automatically using data-driven approaches. And one consequence of this is that we now have usable language technology. So, yes, some of you have used Google Translate. I'm not suggesting it's solved the machine translation problem, but for some language pairs at least, it's really quite good. So I'm going to talk about two success stories from NLP in the last 20 years. The first part of the talk will talk about practical natural language parsing. And what I'll show you is that uh, one of the consequences of moving to this data-driven machine learning approach is that we've now got accurate parsers or analyzers of natural language text that are robust, efficient, and can really do quite a good job on sentences of newspaper text and sentences from Wikipedia and so on. And then the second part, we'll talk about distributional lexical semantics. So this is the idea that we can learn the meanings of words, again, automatically from text based on data-driven voices. So I said we've got these two halves. The first half on, on syntactic parsing, what I want to demonstrate, and this, you'll see how it ties in with the uh, focus of the workshop, is that this is a way of leading to a compositional semantics. So what I want to do is contrast the first half we develop this compositional semantics with the second half where we have this distributional lexical semantics. And towards the end, I've just got a few slides talking about some ideas in which and how we might combine the two approaches. Um, so this talk is very much from a practical language processing perspective, but I want to make the point that I think it's theoretical advances in these areas that will lead us to better language technology. So what I aim to do is introduce what I think is now a fundamental theoretical problem that's relevant to this workshop and also language technology. Um, and also, another reason for this talk is that I wanted to serve as an introduction to some of the computational linguistics issues. So this will be helpful for later talks when people go into a bit more detail on these problems. All right, so the first part was about, about parsing. So let me just give a, a brief introduction to this problem. So this is the problem of taking a sentence of some, naturally, um, sorry, some natural language, such as English, and providing some sort of structured representation. So this is a classic phrase structure from linguistics. Uh, the details aren't too important, but we've got a newspaper sentence here. And you can see what's happened is that we've grouped together subsequences of words into units, or what linguists call constituents, and we've labeled them with uh, various grammatical labels. So things like VP for verb phrase, NP for noun phrase, S for sentence, and so on. Um, now, in the last five years or so, I'd say that the most popular form of structure in terms of automatic parsing has been dependency structures. So this is the sort of structure that people are trying to produce these days automatically. Uh, one of the reasons people like this structure, I think, is because it's very applicable to lots of different languages, particularly languages with free word order, for example. So you can see that what we've got here is a fairly direct representation of the... Um, the way in which the words in the sentence are related. So, for example, John is a subject of the verb it, Paul is a direct object, and so on. And then if we're feeling really ambitious, we might try and derive something like a logical form. This is a, what I might call a semantic representation. Um, again, the details here aren't important, but this is a real example. It's the output of the parser I'm about to describe. It's a pretty print format of something called a discourse representation structure, which some of you might be familiar with from the linguistics literature. And this is essentially a first order logical form. So if you wanted to, you could send it off to a theorem prover and do all sorts of interesting things. So why do we want to build these structures? Well, because we want to get at the meaning of the sentence. So the point about these structured representations is that they allow some access to the semantics. And again, going back to the, uh, sort of the practical language processing side, 
I'm saying that these, or knowing the semantics is useful for a variety of applications, for example, machine translation. I say arguably here because um, despite 40 or 50 years of research in automatic parsing, it's still actually quite hard to find a really compelling example where this sort of parsing technology helps. And certainly Google Translate, for example, doesn't use any sort of semantics or structured representation at all. But still, I think there's the belief in the community that eventually having some fairly sophisticated representation of meaning is going to help with these sorts of tasks. All right, so just to, to finish off this background session, I want to explain why this is a difficult problem. And there are a couple of reasons, at least two reasons. One is that, um, first of all, obtaining the grammar for a natural language is really quite difficult. Um, and here I'm talking about what's often described as a wide coverage or a broad coverage grammar. So what I mean by that is knowledge of what sorts of syntactic constructions or phenomena you can see in a natural language like English. Um, and it turns out that if you want to handle arbitrary real text, so text from newspapers or blogs or even Twitter feeds, then getting this sort of wide, wide coverage grammar is really quite difficult. So that's the first problem. And then the second one is that natural language is surprisingly ambiguous. So I think if we've learned anything in the last 50 years of language processing research, it's the fact that there's really a surprising amount of ambiguity in natural language. Um, and that humans are incredibly adept at resolving it, but computers are not very good. So just to push this ambiguity point, um, this is an example that you often see in the textbook. So the sentence is, John saw the man with the telescope. This is a classic example of syntactic ambiguity. It's ambiguous because John could be either seen with the telescope or the man could be holding the telescope. So the analysis on the left, we've got the prepositional phrase with the telescope is attaching to the verb phrase. So it's the seeing that's being done with the telescope. And the analysis on the right, we've got the prepositional phrase attaching to the noun phrase, the man. So it's the man with the telescope. Now, the reason I've shown you this example is because, first of all, if you're not familiar with the problem, it's very easy to see the ambiguity. Um, but actually, the, I, I don't like this, um, this example. And the reason is that, first of all, it's too hard. I wouldn't expect my parser to be able to solve this ambiguity. Because, of course, the two analyses are perfectly OK. So depending which one is correct really depends on the context. So to solve this problem, you'd really need an awful lot of contextual knowledge and reasoning capabilities that we just don't have at the moment. So this is too hard for my parser. The other reason I don't like it is because the ambiguity is really there, but it's, it's this hidden ambiguity that you can't see. So this example now, we've got the same structures, but the sentence is, John ate the pizza with a fork. Now it's much harder to see the, the ambiguity here because, of course, we know that and we eat pizzas and forks are used for eating. But imagine some crazy restaurant scenario where you've got pizzas coming out with lots of forks on them. Then it's the pizza with the fork that's the correct analysis, this one over here. Now in this particular example, actually I might expect my father to have a go at, at trying to solve this ambiguity. Not based on his sophisticated reasoning, but it, it has knowledge of lexical statistics, what sort of words go together that it's learned from the data. And it might know that eat with a fork is a fairly common construction, whereas pizza with a fork isn't. And just to push this point a little bit further, we've now got uh, John ate the pizza with the anchovies. So, of course, it's the pizza with the anchovies that's the correct analysis of that. Not the So, the problem's a lot worse than you think. And not only the fact that the hidden ambiguity is there, but there's also a huge amount of it. So, these sorts of prepositional phrase constructions and things like coordinations, when you stack them up together, you get this exponential blowout in the number of so there's a huge number of possible parsers, especially when you're using broad coverage grammar. So that's a, a problem. Okay, so the next part of the talk, and I want to talk about um, the grammar that I use in this practical natural language parser. Um, and again, this serves as something like a tutorial for the rest of the workshop, because there are going to be quite a few people talking about what are called type-driven natural language grammars. And the one that I'll describe in a moment is an example of this, um, this type-driven formalism. But first of all, let me just say that if you go and download a, a well-known standard parser from the, the web that's well-known in our research community, typically the, the grammar underlying that would just be a context-free grammar. So this is a trivial grammar. I'm not suggesting this solves our wide coverage grammar problem. So here we can analyze sentences like the dog chased the cat, the cat jumped over the dog, and so on. But my point is if you go and download, say, the Collins or the Charniak parsers, which are very well-known in our community, then formally the grammar underlying those parsers is just a context-free grammar with these sorts of rewrite rules. Uh, but of course there are going to be many more rules for a grammar of English. Now the parser I use is slightly different. 
It's not a context-free grammar. It's an example of uh, something called a categorical grammar, uh, which is, in fact, has been around in the linguistics literature for a long time. I think the original work was in the 1930s by some Polish mathematicians. And as I said, this is an example of what's called a type-driven grammar, and it's also lexicalized. So these are key properties of the grammar forms. So the basic idea is that in this variant of categorical grammar, combinatory categorical grammar, to each word in a sentence we assign an, an elementary syntactic structure, what's called a lexical category. So here's an example for an intransitive verb, walk. <coughs> and what this category here is doing is essentially encoding the functional structure that you see in language. So the way you're supposed to read this is as a function. It's a function that wants a noun phrase for a, as an argument, and it wants it to the left. You see this slash here pointing to the left, so that's the direction of the argument. And when it's found that noun phrase, we'll get back a sentence. I'll show you some example derivations in a moment, and you'll see how it all fits together. So then, in, in addition to this, these lexical categories, which make up the lexicon, we have a small number of what are called combinatory rules that tell you how to put the categories together. So let's see a few more categories. So first of all, we've got what are called atomic categories. So these are ones without any slashes. So these aren't functional. Things like S for sentence, N for noun, NP for noun phrase, PP for prepositional phrase. And in fact, in my parts, are not many more than that, quite a small number of atomic categories. But then we can build up these complex categories recursively from the atomic categories and the slashes. So let's see some more examples. So what I mean by type-driven is that you can see these are types, syntactic types that indicate the sort of functional behavior of typically verbs. So if we've got a transitive verb like respected, it's the same as the intransitive verb, but I put an extra argument. We're now looking to the right for a noun phrase. So a transitive verb is something that takes a noun phrase to its right, gives you a function which wants a noun phrase to its left, which gives you a sentence. So you can think of these functions as curried, if you're familiar with that. So you can take the arguments one at a time. And then if you want a diatransitive verb, like gave, so John gave Mary the book, we could put another NP. Again, we're looking to the right for another noun phrase. So the easiest way to see how this works is to fit it all together in derivation. I'm working on some biomedical texts at the moment, which is why I've got these sorts of examples. So you can see that inhibits is a function, it's got this functional type and it needs a noun phrase to its right first of all, and we've got one of those in this example uh, under production. So we can combine these categories together and we do that using functional application. So it's called forward application because the argument is to the right. <coughs> but this is essentially functional application, we've taken the function and applied it to its argument. Another nice way to think about it is you can think of the categories in blue as effectively cancelled. So inhibits production is now a constituent or a unit and it has this type, it's functional again. In fact, it's just the type of a verb phrase in English. It's just a sentence missing a noun phrase to the left. And we've got one of those in this example. So again, we can use function application. This time backward because we're going in the other direction. Um, and we've got a sentence. So that's a very simple derivation in the combinatory category of grammar. Now, um, I said that this talk is really about semantics. So there's a very straightforward way of adding uh, semantics to this, uh, this derivation in a compositional fashion. So one standard way of doing it is that we have this, these lambda expressions that again indicate functions in our semantics. And essentially what this derivation will do is bind the arguments into those argument positions of the function. And if you like, I'm not going to go too much into how we might interpret these, but if you can think of prod prime as being some object in a model theoretic semantics in a domain and inhibit prime is some relation to the standard sort of so, here's the key idea that when we do function application at the level of the syntax, that's exactly the same operation that we'll perform for semantics. So, one property of this sort of, well, of categorical grammars in general, it's often described as being, as having um, a very nice transparent interface between the syntax and the semantics. And all that means really is that the operation we perform with the syntax will be the same one that we perform with the semantics. So, all I've done here is apply this function to its argument, and I've done the beta reduction, so I've substituted prod prime for x, and we can do the same thing for our next function application, uh, and we end up with that predicate argument structure at the bottom. Okay, so that's a fairly simple example. Let me show you a more interesting one. Hold on, sorry, I haven't got it. So let me just say, um, I want to say how this formalism relates to uh, context-free grammar. Um, and in fact, we haven't really achieved an awful lot at this stage in the sense that classical categorical grammar, so that's the categorical grammar where we just have the application rules, is context-free and powerful. So what that means is that the 
the sets of strings or languages that the formalism can describe is exactly the same languages that you can describe in the context of free So the way I like to think of it is that what I've done here is I've taken that derivation that's normally written with the words at the top and I've just turned it upside down. So we've got this binary tree. If we think about how that would look with the context free grammar, we'd probably analyze it something like this. So what I like to one way I like to think of categorical grammar is that we've taken the information in these context-free grammar rewrite rules. Namely, in English, a sentence can be made up of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. A verb phrase can be a verb followed by a noun phrase. And we've pushed all that information down into the lexical category. So that information now is down in this type, this syntactic type. And that's what I mean by lexical. There's really quite a lot of information in these lexical categories. Okay, so just to finish off, this formalism, let's have a look at a more interesting derivation. This is something that this particular variant of categorical grammar handles very nicely. It's an example of what's called object extraction as a relative clause, so which Microsoft bought is a relative clause. So it's called extraction because you're supposed to think that in the underlying meaning representation, there's sort of a hole here next to bought, which is the object, the company, and it's been pulled out to the front in this relative clause construction. Now the first thing to notice is that the category for bought is exactly the one that we saw earlier for the transitive verb, so that hasn't changed. So in particular, um, we're still looking for this noun phrase to the right here, there's this sort of gap that's been pulled out to the front. So we have to have some clever way of dealing with that fact. So the first thing we do is introduce a new operation, a new combinatory rule called type raising. See, this is slightly different, it's a unary rule, so it takes an atomic category and turns it into a function. So the way I like to think of this is that before, we had this idea that the verb was the function um, and the subject and the object were these atomic categories. But um, you might think to yourself, well, why do we make the verb the function? Why not the subject? And that's what we've done here. So effectively turn that idea on its head. So a nice way to think about a subject noun phrase in terms of a function is that it looks to its right for a verb phrase. So a sentence missing a noun phrase to its left. And when it's found one of those, we just get a sentence back. Now, we want to combine these two categories, but there's a problem because this NP is getting in the way. So we've got a verb phrase here, a sentence missing an out phrase to its left, which is the thing that we want. But this NP is in the way. So we have a new combinatory rule, this time just function composition, forward composition just because of the direction. And again, think of the categories in blue as cancelling. That's a nice way of thinking about it. And now something interesting has happened because Microsoft bought is a perfectly good constituent in this format. Actually, a lot of linguistic formalism this wouldn't be a constituent, but it is in the combination category of grammar. It has a very natural type, it's just a sentence missing a noun phrase to the right. So that's this hole here that we're missing. So a lot of the action in this derivation is in this category of the relative pronoun, because it's looking to the right for exactly this type. So the relative pronoun, in some sense, knows that there's an object missing, because it's looking to its right for a sentence missing a noun phrase. So we can pick that up just with application, so which Microsoft bought is now just a noun phrase modifier. Um, okay, so that was a very quick introduction to uh, type-driven formalisms for linguistics. Let me just say a little bit about how we go about building a practical parser. So I said that the method these days is to, um, it's very much data-driven, so all the knowledge that we need comes from data, and the resource that we use is often called a tree bank. So this is a resource that contains um, 40,000 sentences of newspaper text annotated with combinatory categorical grammar derivations. So all I've done here again is I've just taken one of those derivations and turned it upside down. Um, and one point to make here is tree banks like this take years to build. So in fact the way this tree bank was built is it's based on something called the University of Pennsylvania tree bank, the Penn tree bank that was built in the early 90s, that took about three years to construct. So that contains phrase structure trees, like I showed you right at the beginning. And then Julia Hockenmeyer, um, as an Edinburgh PhD student, took the pen tree bank and converted it into CCG. And that took a year or two as well. So this is really quite a, um, a time, labor-intensive process. But still, we have this resource. So the first thing we can do with it is induce a grammar. So this goes back to my question of where does this wide coverage grammar come? And for this particular formalism, because it's lexicalized, getting the grammar is very easy. We essentially just read it off the leaves of the trees. So what I mean by that, it, suppose this were a real example in our tree bank. We could learn, for example, that persuades can have this particular syntactic type. And that would then go into our lexicon or dictionary. 
So the lexicons are mapping from words onto sets of lexical categories, and this will go into the set that displays. Um, so that essentially is the grammar, because this is lexicalized, but then on top of that we have that small number of manually defined combinatory rules, the composition applications. And in fact, just a few more than I've shown you, but really not many more. We just take those from Mark Stevens' book. So what happens when we do this? We get around 1,200 of these category types. Now, one obvious question is, well, this is a finite sample, not terribly big, actually, just a million words, 40,000 sentences. What happens if I show you a newspaper sentence that wasn't in the data? And actually, you get very high coverage in the sense that it's highly unlikely when you go and look at a new newspaper sentence that you'll get a type that you didn't have in your training book. So that's why I encourage you. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this aspect, but there's another um, feature of the tree bank, which is that it provides training data for the st statistical models. So the way that we're going to solve that ambiguity problem is we essentially have machine learning models that learn that particular configurations in the derivation are likely, and those are learned from the data, and we can use those to disambiguate new sets. Okay, so this is how we parse with it. So stage one, we've got the words in the sentence, and we assign those lexical categories, those syntactic types. And this is essentially a standard tagging task in computational linguistics. So a tagging problem is one where you're given a sentence and you want to assign labels to each word. Um, and the standard way of doing that is you just go left to right, you look at the local context for each word, and you have some machine learning method that tells you what the correct category should be. So one very important point here is that that's just a linear time process, left to right. We can do that extremely fast. So I think we've got one tagger that tags something like 200,000 words a second. Or so we can, we can do this part of the process very fast indeed. Then the second stage, and it's more expensive, is we start to put the categories together using those combination rules. I'm not going to go into any details on this, but essentially there are very standard uh, parsing algorithms you can use for doing it. We use a chart parsing algorithm. And then finally, this solves the ambiguity problem. We have some probability model or machine learning model that we've learned from the tree bank um, that essentially tells us what the highest scoring derivation is if we want to return just one analysis. And there's a standard algorithm called Viterbi that finds that efficient. So, just to finish off this section, what we've got now is a practical parser that we've applied to various types of sentences, not just newspapers, but also biomedical research, Wikipedia and questions. Um, and surprisingly fast, because of um, some statistical pruning um, and also some highly optimized C++ code. So, in fact, we had a workshop at Johns Hopkins last year on the final day in the morning when we're giving our final presentation. Uh, we started the parser running on 90 CPUs in Sydney. We had access to some machines in Sydney, I think all the students were away, uh, and I think by the end of the morning we passed the whole of Wikipedia. So Wikipedia's got a billion words of text. So one message actually I want to get across in this talk is that language processing over the last 10 years or so has gone large scale. So a billion words isn't frightening to us anymore, we can handle that sort of thing. And okay, um, an obvious question is how accurate is it? Uh, that's a whole other talk about, it turns out that um, measuring accuracy is an interesting research question in its own right. But I think the best method we've got at the moment for doing this is to see how well the parser recovers what I'm calling grammatical relations. So what I mean by that is some noun is the subject of some verb, some noun is the object of some verb, and so on. And for that, we get about 83%. So I don't know how meaningful that number is. I mean, when I'm giving a talk, what I normally say at this point is that if it means anything at all to have a single number that somehow represents the state of the art in statistical parsing, then it's probably about 80%. Okay, so summarize part one. Um, we've got this practical parser that can build what I'm calling fairly sophisticated compositional semantic representations. Although, let me just add a caveat here. Uh, for any semanticists in the audience, I'm not suggesting for a minute that we've solved the how to represent natural language problem. Clear. Um, but still, we do have this parser that can produce these first order logical representations. Now, the thing that this sort of compositional semantics is really good at is that if I've got a sentence like the dog chased the cat, it can tell us that there's some chasing event going on, the dog's doing the chasing, the cat's being chased. But clearly there are other elements of natural language semantics that this just misses out on entirely. So, for example, in this case, it doesn't tell us anything about cats and dogs. It doesn't tell us they're similar, that they're both cats and animals. So that's what I want to talk about in the second part of this. So, I'll um, just say a little bit about lexical semantics. From a linguistics perspective, this is study the meanings of words. So, can I, can I ask a question about this first part? 
So you described the rudimentary type theory for, for handling this, this work. What, what, what constructions do you have in, the, in this type theory? Uh, do you allow overloading, for instance, that words have multiple types? Yeah. Um, yeah. can, can you ask me that question at the end? Do you mind? Is it just that I'm going to run out of time? So, is that okay? So let, let me come back to it, and if I don't answer it, remind me. Um, so these are the sorts of lexical relations that linguists are interested in. So things like synonymy, two words are synonymous, it's roughly got the same meaning. Hyperonymy, animal is a hyponym of cat because cat is a kind of animal. Um, and so I mean, in fact, the ones that I'm going to focus on mainly here, in fact, is synonymy. That's the relation that I'm most, most interested in. So back to the practical motivation again. Um, I just want to give you one example of where this, these sorts of lexical relations are really useful. They're, they're useful across a range of language processing applications. Um, the obvious one is document retrieval. So this is the standard web search task that, you, that Google does every day. So the idea is that um, if I type some keywords into Google like cheap cars or something like that, and there's some website that's talking about cheap automobiles, not a terribly compelling example, but, but if we know that car means the same thing as automobile, we can add automobile to our, uh, well, the, the system can add automobile automatically to the query terms, and then hopefully retrieve that page. Now, okay, the obvious question is where does this lexical semantic knowledge come from? Uh, we could create some thesaurus or dictionary by hand, uh, but there are obvious problems with that. It's very expensive. It's difficult to keep up to date because language is changing all the time. And these sorts of resources tend to have minimal coverage. So what we'd like to do is, is generate these automatically from the text. Um, so we're going to do this based on what's often called the distribution hypothesis. So the idea is that we can represent the meaning of the word by the distribution of other words that appear in that word's context. And it's, you have to quote this if he fits him from first, maybe giving this sort of talk. You should know a word or the meaning of the word by the company that it keeps. That's sort of the intuition. So, a bit more on the intuition, let's go back to this dog and cat example. So these are related semantically in some way. And the way that we can think about that is that if we go and look at a large body of text, so billions of words, idea, let's go large scale, um, then the idea is that if we look at lots of instances of the word dog, we'll see that it co-occurs with other words like big, small, furry, eat and sleep. And stuff. By co-occur, well, I'll define that in a moment, but I essentially mean that words like big and small occur in the context of dog. And we can do the same thing for cat. And what we'll hopefully find is that those contexts tend to be fairly similar. And of course there's a reason for it. It's because, well, this reflects reality. Because dogs and cats can be big, small, furry, and they eat and sleep. So if we take ship and boat as another example, a slightly different notion of context here. So if we were to be able to parse lots of data, we find that ship and boat appear as the direct object of verbs like sail, clean, and bought, and so on, uh, modified by adjectives like large, clean, and expensive. And again, this reflects reality because ships and boats are the kind of things that can be sailed clean and all they can be large clean and expensive. So what we'd like to do is build up these distribution representations and infer the lexical relations automatically. Uh, so I'll show you a picture in a moment, to be a bit clearer. Just in terms of the definition of context, I think in later talks we'll see more complex notions. This is a very simple notion of context, often called a window method. And basically, if we want to find the meaning of what I'm calling a head word here, so this is the word that we'd like to find the meaning of, something like dog or cat. Then what we do is we just look at a fixed word window either side of the head word. So we go into our large body of text and we find every instance of the word dog. And then we just look, for example, five words either side and we see which words occur in that context. Um, and then we create a vector. So we put this in a vector space. And each component of the vector corresponds to a word in the vocabulary. So we'll see an example of and then um, the value of each component is just a frequency, it's the number of times that the vocabulary word appears in the context of the head. So let's suppose that we want to know the meaning of the word dog and also cat. Now in practice, this, this um, vector space would be multidimensional, it would perhaps have thousands, tens of thousands of dimensions, all the different vocabulary words. Um, and what we do is we go and look at each instance of the word dog, and we count the number of times that we see the word sleep either side of it. And we do the same thing, count the number of times we see the word eat, and perhaps the word the, I'll come back to the in a moment. And we do a similar thing for cat, and the hope is that these um, vector representations will be similar. So now we've got this nice geometric interpretation. We can just take a cosine similarity metric, for example, that will hopefully tell us that dog and cat are similar in meaning. 
Now the reason I've, I've put the down there is that um, this isn't terribly important, but my point is that we do something a little bit more sophisticated. So there's some notion in which the words sleep and eat are quite informative when you want to know the meaning of the word dog and cat, but the is pretty hopeless. I mean, it doesn't distinguish at all between things of nouns because it tends to occur with everything. So the various ways you can deal with that, one very obvious way is rather than just taking the frequency of the number of times we see the word the in the context of dog, we'll also divide by the number of times we see the in total. So because we see it an awful lot, the way I like to think of it is that effectively shrinks the basis vector on that dimension makes it less important. But this isn't too, this isn't too important. I just want to make the point that there are quite sophisticated ways of, of dealing with this notion of informative. So what I'm going to do now is show you some results. I think the, the best way to demonstrate this approach is to um, show you the results from real experiments. So this was based on some work that James Curran did, who's also a PhD student at Edinburgh a few years ago. So basically, for each head word, and that's the word that we're interested in finding the meaning of, dog or cat or boat or ship, um, we create a vector. And then for that given word, we return, say, the top end ranked words as synonyms. So if we're in the business of creating a thesaurus, for example, well, a list of head words and then all the words that the head words are synonyms. Now, just want to show you some examples, actually an interesting question here is to think what sort of relations do we get? So the output for the word company is quite interesting because you get things like subsidiary, unit, firm, industry, and so on. So clearly we're not getting just synonyms here at all. Um, in fact, we've got some hyponyms, so subsidiary, it's not the same thing as company, but it's a kind of company. Um, and then you get other pairs where it's not quite clear what the relation is, so things like company and industry. Um, but I just make the point here, actually for practical applications, it's not clear that's a problem. So going back to that query expansion example, if we had company as a keyword in our Google query search, it might well be useful to add the word industry as well. Okay, so I said I'd show you some output. Um, these words in bold are the head words. These are words that we're trying to find the synonyms for. Um, actually, James did something rather nice in his thesis. He, at every, the start of every chapter, the first chapter's introduction, he had this bit at the top with the top ten words from the system, so that's where these examples come from. So that explains why they're all a little bit abstract. But the thing that always strikes me about this, I've given this example quite a few times, is how good the results are. It always blows me away every time. So look, launch, implementation, advent, edition, they're absolutely brilliant. Of course, there are always some oddities in there. So the ones in um, italics are ones that in some sense has gone wrong. I mean, they're sort of opposites, aren't they? Antonyms, elimination is in some sense the opposite of introduction. And then you always get some weird ones. This is a feature of automatic acquisition, things like a red. I've got no idea why that comes out of introduction. So there was an evaluation session of James' thesis, and that's the sort of thing that you get out. So this is done entirely automatically from 2 billion words of text. There's no manual input to this process at all. I think the other thing that strikes me about this is that one of the advantages that people often talk about this sort of method is that it often finds words that a human lexicographer might well struggle to think of. It's really quite a difficult task if you're sat down as a human thinking, um, you, know, you go out and look at text for sure, but what are the synonyms of context? Which is quite a hard problem. All right, so I'll move on. More so that's the, um, the end of part two. So to try and bring all this thing together, so here's the interesting problem, which um, I hope you'll start to see some connection with the workshop. So the, the issue is, can we extend this vector space model beyond words? So I think it's a really promising approach. But I'd like to do a bit more than just know that cat and dog are similar. So in particular, can we learn automatically that man reads newspaper is similar to boy browser's magazine? So it's a little contrived example. Um, but if we could extend this similarity notion to larger units like sentences, this would have a huge number of applications in natural language processes. So the obvious problem with the current model is that it doesn't take any account of the syntactic relations. So, okay, we might learn that man is similar to boy and that reads is similar to browsers and so on. But at the moment, we've got no way of saying that, crucially, dog bites man is different to man bites dog. So we'd like that information to know as well. So, the sort of grand challenge is to develop a compositional distribution semantics that combines the strengths of the two approaches. So the basic idea will be that at the word level, we'll have these vector spaces that capture the less of a semantic similarity. And then we'd like some operator on these vector spaces that captures these syntactic relations. And what I really like about this idea is that if we can build these sentence vectors, 
because we've got this nice geometrical interpretation, we've got a very natural, easy way of comparing the similarity of those sentences. Just take um, an inner product or cosine sigma. So in terms of the operator, what we'd like is, the idea is that we've got vectors for man and magazine and reads. Is there some way that we can combine those vectors to give us a vector for man reads magazine? It turns out there is some existing work on this. It goes back to the, um, at the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, Paul Smolensky worked on this problem. Very similar problem in cognitive science when you're trying to combine connectionist and symbolic methods. And he, um, has a lot of papers where he's advocating the use of a tensor product representation to do this sort of thing. And also, I think one of the speakers in this workshop um, has looked at what's often called the petfish problem. So I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that um, it's a psychology problem. If you ask human subjects whether something called a guppy is a good example of a pet, they'll say no, not really. And if you say is it a good example of a fish, they'll say no. But if you say is it a good example of a petfish, they'll say yes. There's something a bit weird going on. And the idea of this paper is very interesting is that um, this notion of guppy as a pet fish somehow emerges out of a tensor product representation. And just to link in with the workshop, that particular paper is, it compares this idea to how quantum entities combine in a Hilbert space uh, format. So, to conclude, uh, I'm going to be really bold here and say that I think we've got a fundamental new problem in the semantics of natural language. Now, one interesting the issue with this is that so far I've presented this in terms of a semantics of similarity. So in these vector space models, there's no way in which you sort of go out and hook up to the world with your semantics. So philosophically, you might have a problem with that. So I think there's an interesting question about whether these vector space methods can be reduced or um, how they relate to, say, a Montague semantics, a more theoretic semantics. And this solution will certainly be of practical interest, but also I mean, theoretically it's very interesting. So just to finish off, the, of course, the, the subtitle of this workshop is the, the flowing theme or something like that. So I've taken a picture from a paper that Manoush and Bob and I wrote together. I think we'll be hearing a bit more about this later in the workshop. And you can see the idea is we've got some vector representation, some sort of syntactic analysis, and we can combine them using this flow of information. And that's all sort of questions and we'll start with the one. Yeah. My first question is about this type structure. So what you allow, you, you, you mentioned already overload, overloading, what else? Uh, oh, so you're asking what, what operations? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. operations on types. Oh, I see, yeah, so we've got, um, so what did I show you? I showed you forward and backward application, forward composition. There's also a notion of backward application, which is when the slashes go in the other direction. There's something called, I'm um, oh, sorry, backward composition. It's also a backward cross composition. So I think that the short answer is uh, Mark Steepman has a story about what operations we should allow from a linguistic perspective. Um, and there are some that you wouldn't want to allow because they massively overgenerate. Um, from my point of view, I'm a bit more of a, a pragmatist. I'm essentially happy to allow any operation in there that gives me better performance. It's not a great answer. But so you see, so this sort of linguistic answer, which is going to read Mark Steepman's book. Um, and then there's the pragmatic answer, which is I'm prepared to try any sort of operations and see what that does to my performance. But we have about seven, I think, in terms of smaller. Can I ask a short follow-up question? Okay. I'm, I'm outside of here, but I get, get a bit lost. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Where things are manual and spiritual, uh -huh. right? things are automatic. Yeah. So it's you mentioned question. this, this library of pen. Yeah. Uh, that, which took two years to build. This yeah. must have been manual. Yeah. And, and so, where is the, the, the equilibrium or the yeah. relation? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I mean, people really would like to do away with the manual work altogether. So, what really happens in practice is that you take an existing parser and correct the output. So, it's not quite as bad as it sounds, but still, it's very labor intensive. Now, the, the issue is that if you want to try and induce all this structure automatically from, say, just raw text, or maybe text with some basic grammatical labels, there's a lot of work on that. The resulting performance isn't very good, and that's a really hard problem. Uh, people relate that problem to the, um, the language acquisition problem, and sort of the scientific angle as well. So my take on it at the moment is that if we're in the business of building practical language technology over the next five or ten years, um, we should be using the manual resources because they're available. But then the, um, we, we use machine learning 
to induce the grammar under this ambiguation. You will first find those. <laughs> Just um, so you gave this statistic of 80 odd percent of correctness for passing. So I was wondering what's the nature of the failure? Because I could imagine you could fail because you did your initial lexicalization wrongly, and you could fail because you have too much liberty in your grammar and you end up with the wrong answer. Yeah. Uh, is there any other ways? Or, or I mean, do you know what the, what the kind of proportion is of the average? Yeah, that's a nice question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. It's good. Um, I guess the main source of error is in the disambiguation. So I think the grammar is pretty good. I mean, there are obvious gaps in it because we're only abusing this, these 40,000 sentences. So the really hard problem is if you've got a word that you've seen 50 times before with three syntactic types, but you're missing one. That's the hard case, and that, that certainly occurs. Uh, but I think the grammar is pretty good covering. So I, if we had a much better disambiguation, though, because we're doing all this over generation, we could probably get up to low 90s. But uh, the other answer is that you get this tail where there's just so many things that go wrong, and that's why the whole thing's so hard. Yeah, should the vector space hold the meaning? Um, how do you choose the basis for this case? Oh, yeah, for the lexical semantics. Um, typically, that would be, um, well, in this case, um, just lots of words. So just be a huge vocabulary. You might take that automatically from the data. So typically, you'd have sort of, I don't know, tens of thousands. Will you choose the lowest frequency 10,000 or highest frequency 10,000? Yes. So this, yeah, you might apply some frequency cut up or something. But yeah, I think you'd take the worst from the data. Uh, I, I don't understand. In your grammar, you use the statement types. That's right. So the grammar used to make the parsing of the text. And you were doing the parsing on the English text, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what you were saying at the end of your talk is that you are thinking to apply to groups instead of the I don't think they are exactly equivalent. Yeah. There is a different logical basis in the statement types. Yeah, I had three groups in my picture. And they mainly are like Islamic syntactic characters for the logical yeah. point of view. So. so I think what we've done is the theoretical work we've done so far, it's only been theoretical, we've looked at pre -business. But if you wanted to build um, a practical parser with a pre group grammar, the problem is that you'd need something like pen tree So you'd have to go through that process of turning that into a pre group grammar. Actually, my feeling is that in practice, I don't really think. So I think what we're planning to do is that, in theory, we might well use pre-groups, but when we actually do the experiments, we'll use the parser just to get the trees. Yeah. Well, yeah. Please uh, back first. Can I have two questions? They're both short. If they're quick. Okay. okay. Um, the first question: You showed the type base in the beginning, and if I turn the type system to number type base, it's just is this just a motion abstraction? Yes. Okay. And the second question. I mean, if we try to do it for Chinese. Well, for example, yes. Well, I, th I, mean, I think this method would work for any language. Would it be an aid to understanding which language someone would use? Oh, I see. Um, well, it, it, it might be, but there are much simpler ways of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there, <laughs> are, there are other examples. Of so the question of whether you could use this method to do translation is an interesting question. Well, simply to identify a language. No, there are other ways of doing it. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd go to these lengths to solve that problem. Sure. Um, I have two short questions. Uh, to, uh, both are related to the lexical inference, uh, like when you compare cats and dogs as a bird. Uh, my question is, uh, first of all, is how to, uh, from the large vocabulary of English, how to, uh, how, how do you choose uh, the words to be compared? Uh, like, how do you know you want to compare cats and dogs? Yeah, which is a good answer to that. Um, it might depend on your application. So you probably go out and again derive the, the words that you're interested in automatically from the text. Yeah, and the second question is uh, uh, how the, the comparison should reach to what, uh, what, what extent, like both cat, dog, and bird are similar. They are both, all animals, like cats and dog are more similar. Uh, uh -huh. uh, do we have, do the further research need to reach the details of this? Well, 
Well, so I think we would hope that cat would come out more similar to dog. I mean, it's a little tricky that one. I mean, how do you evaluate this thing? You might ask humans to say, on a scale of one to five, tell me how similar cat and dog are, and how similar dog and bird are, and maybe you know, cat and dog would be 4.2, and dog and bird would be 3.7. And then you would hope that that would be reflected in the vector space. But of course, the other way you might evaluate it is with, with a real application. So if you had an application where you really needed dog and cat to be more similar than dog and bird, then that would come out of the Okay, I think in the interest of sticking to the schedule, we'd better uh, finish there. Uh,